And I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi. And you are listening to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast. A warm hello, listeners. I'm Dr. Adam Jirachi, and welcome back to Love's a Secret Weapon podcast after a brief hiatus. How are you today, Donna? Oh, great, Adam. Thank you so much for reconvening. It feels like forever. I know we've had a lot going on between the two of us. You know, so I hope our listeners, um, you know, have been patient with us and um, that we can kind of dig, dig back into uh, this incredible experience that we're having together. And yeah, during this sort of hiatus, I've always had a fascination with Sedona, Arizona. Mm. I even mm. wrote a song about it in 1980, which uh, you know you can you can listen to on YouTube. But anyway, um, I'm back in Arizona. I moved, uh, <laughs> you know, from Hawaii to California, and that was about ten years ago. And mm. and uh, lo and behold, you know, my my husband Jared's first love is Arizona. He's had so many different uh, experiences here and created a family. And one of his daughters lives here and has a new little grandbaby. So mm. um, we're, you know, we're, we're doing that now. Um, took a little bit to, you know, uproot and pack up. And, um, and we've been here for about a week and um, it's feeling very good. So, <laughs> and that's quite a that's quite a fairly big, uh, substantial move. So, uh, understandably, that's been uh, taking you away from the keyboard for a little while. And and I myself have had some uh, uh, time away as well. Um, we uh, recently had a uh, a family death, and so we've just been spending time as a family. Um, spending time together and, and I guess uh, taking some time to deal with that as much as you as you can. So uh, I, uh, Donna was probably, uh, you know, trampsing around the country, whereas I was kind of at home, but we, we both weren't able to, uh, to uh, convene. So it's so nice to get back to together. And I'm sure our listeners will be patient with us if we were tiny bit rusty it's it's only been probably a, a <laughs> few weeks but when we have a break in talking it does seem like a lot longer than it probably has been so yes uh, darling I'm I, I miss I miss sharing our lives together and it's an it's amazing how the coronavirus has created so much change all over the world um you know has brought out so much kind of tragedy and mm. um and and sort of um, a lesson of, as you were saying, families coming together and um, same here, families mm. coming together. Even though I have family in, in Los Angeles, um, I mean, for instance, when I announced to my son that I'm moving here, he's like, well, we'll be visiting <laughs> ASAP. So mm. um, it, the coronavirus has um, just very many... Uh, layers and depths of of meaning for for this planet to change hopefully in a in a good way yeah and i hope so too if anything can come of this a terrible time for so many people is that we do come back in a different way that we don't come back and continue i guess a lot of the things that we've been doing that ultimately are not working whatever they are i think it's been a time to for many people to see what's in important to hopefully be kinder to ourselves and to other people and and i guess to recognize that common humanity that we that we mm. do uh have um so yeah it'll it'll be interesting to see how we progress as vaccines are rolled out and things begin to open up a, a little bit i think there's been a lot more travel um, so I'm, I'm sure people do want to travel across the country, whereas before it was probably, you know, getting in a plane and, and traveling overseas. Not, me not many of us or any of us are really doing that anymore. And, and so there's a bit of a chance to uh, kind of go cross country and experience one's own uh, backyard. Yes. <laughs> well, this is a, an expansive backyard, I must say. Yes. <laughs> and I do um, express my great empathy and sympathy toward 
uh, your loss and um, your partner's loss. And um, I'm sure all of us, you know, have been experiencing, you know, a great deal of loss in mm. the last uh, year and a half. So in one way or another, you know. Yes, yes, absolutely. In, it's in... a more more difficult way of coming together. Yes, yes. That's, I think uh, I couldn't say it better myself with, with that. And it's interesting, uh, timing is, is always everything. And uh, so, of course, you've had a, had a recent move, but where we last left off in our previous episode, you were preparing to move out of your parents' home for the first time. Uh, and that's where we're going to pick up uh, today in a chapter entitled, well, maybe I should let you uh, tell the listeners what the name of this chapter is. This is Chapter 11, Blowing Out the Candles. <laughs> Go, Donna. Hi, I'm Donna Lauren to tell you about an exciting new contest from Dr. Pepper. Two big first prizes, two dazzling new Excalibur SS Roadsters. It's an $8,000 replica of the 1927 Mercedes-Benz SSK. 300 horsepower, automatic transmission, air horns, and other sporty accessories. It's Dr. Pepper's exciting new Treads, Threads, and Treasure contest. Remember, two Excaliburs plus an authentic raccoon coat and money! $200 a month for 12 full months! Plus over 1,500 other prizes, including color television sets, electric typewriters, and thousands in cash. Enter now. Pick up a carton or two of Dr. Pepper with official entry blanks. Enjoy Dr. Pepper, the distinctively different soft drink. And don't forget Dr. Pepper's Treads, Threads, and Treasure. And hurry! 1966, my 19th year proved to be a rites of passage in so many ways. The new Stingray Corvettes were hot off the showrooms of Chevrolet dealers. Dr. Pepper kept me traveling relentlessly, so the years rolled past for a teenage starlet without a driver's license. At last, I was going to enjoy some of the benefits of working. I would have never insisted money was spent that would take away from the necessities. The whole reason that I was dedicated to my career, at least on an intellectual level, was to be responsible for my family. But in being responsible for my family, I had some awareness that I had been successful enough to be able to ask for a car. I had a sense that it was time for me to have some tangible evidence of what I had earned. In all the years I worked, money was an enigma. It was never tangible. I never touched it. I made it, and my parents handled it. Money was such a disease in my head. I felt excluded from ever knowing my own value. My parents did not show any resistance when I made this initial strong request. I really did have the awareness that what the money represented was more freedom. The big day came when the three of us drove to Hollywood. Sean La Chevrolet featured a little red Corvette with a white convertible top and a red leather interior, power steering, power windows, 357 horsepower under the hood. I chose automatic transmission. Write the check. $4,300 later and I was behind the wheel of my very own little red Corvette. Happily, I drove my car off the showroom floor, straight to the arms of my new hot boyfriend. On one of the local rock and roll TV shows in L.A., I met a tall, dark, and handsome man. My longtime boyfriend, Bob, remained platonic, and there was a gap at this time when we were not socializing as much. I had an instant chemistry with Mr. Wright, and I invited him to meet my parents. An all-black 1966 Lincoln Continental pulled into my driveway the day he was to meet my parents. I hate to sound overly materialistic, but in those days, cars were king. I couldn't wait to go for a ride in his big black beauty. I greeted him at the door and brought him through the house to the backyard. My mother greeted us, 
wearing a bathing suit top and a pair of shorts, revealing her belly rolls, <laughs> and Maury in shorts and shirtless. They both accepted him with open arms. When I suggested that he take me for a ride in the neighborhood not far from home, they agreed it was okay. Oh my goodness. Surrounded by plush leather upholstery, he pressed the electric switch, making all the windows go down. You know how it is sitting in a car and there are no frames restricting your view or arm space? Just a wide open area to let your hair blow and your dreams fly. I told him to drive up the hill and turn right on Palms. Go one block and turn right again on Mountain View. Go slow, I said, and park here. He turned the engine off and pulled me over to him on his luxurious leather bench seat. And then he kissed me. My lips were wet from his and he wrapped me in his arms as if to say, I'll take care of everything. Mr. Wright not only passed the test that he was successful, but he also made me feel safe and he was Jewish. I never cared about religion. I respected one's beliefs and their right and privilege to practice their faith. Limiting a relationship to your own tribe has never been my belief. It was my parents' standard unless they made the exception. Nineteen. Nineteen years old and no driver's license. Well, I asked my new boyfriend to teach me how to drive. He told me he never let anyone drive his car before. But for me, he would make an exception. Uh, I took four driving lessons behind the wheel of that huge Continental. My last lesson was on a rainy day. I stepped on the brakes on Wilshire Boulevard in Beverly Hills and slid. Well, that taught me how much oil is left on asphalt and when wet becomes very slippery. I studied for my driving test and passed with flying colors. Never crossed my mind to leave my parents' home, my home, but when my new love proposed that I live with him, I became obsessed over his passionate persuasion. Now that I knew how to drive and I had my own car in a huff, I moved out of Grandview Boulevard and into a furnished studio apartment on Almont Drive in Beverly Hills. Parked in the subterranean lot next to his big black Lincoln was my bright new little red Corvette. Upstairs in our apartment was a hotel-like ambiance. Whose bed was it? We had to make it our own. My first time making love was so natural, I had an orgasm with great ease. The sheet was stained with a trickle of my blood. A few days later, there came a knock on the door on our apartment with the sound of my mother's pleading voice coming from the other side. Someone else was with her. I suspected it to be my great aunt Clara, who was always very discouraging and disapproving of me. Come home now, my mother screeched. The two of them decided to make a scene. The paradox of ecstasy to tragedy threw me into emotional paralysis. Aunt Clara had an unusually negative effect on me. Maury would come home from drawing animation all day and before dinner sit with the tape recorder of a singing lesson I had. He'd play the tape of my teacher, Don Friendly, accompanying me, and I would sing with myself. Every night, this was a ritual from seven years of age. There were times when Clara would be there visiting and would whisper loudly to my mother, she'll never make it. So now, her wickedness teamed up with my mother to sabotage my independence. I never even opened the door. They finally went away and gave up on the idea of pounding on the door and creating high drama within the hallowed walls of this Beverly Hills building. At this time, our family friend Carl did an about face with my parents. He was appalled at their behavior toward me and decided to stop talking to them. However, he quietly waited for an opportunity to remain my ally. Soon after this incident, 
I began aching in my abdomen. This pain was paralyzing me. And several hours went by when I broke down and surprised myself by asking my boyfriend to take me home. I was on survival mode when I got to my parents' house and I went directly to my mother's room and crawled into her bed, not my own, and curled up in the fetal position. 18 hours had passed and the pain was excruciating. My mother called Dr. Kemp, our family physician, and I remember hearing Dr. Kemp say to my parents that I needed exploratory surgery. When I woke up 36 hours later, I looked up and there was a familiar face standing next to the bed in the hospital room. In my post-operative haze, I recognized him as a William Morris agent who I used to see at their offices. He told me that he had donated his blood to me. The nurse who was attending to my needs noticed I was conscious and blurted out that one quart of blood had been floating in my abdominal cavity and I'd been bleeding internally. She then exclaimed that my ovaries had been removed and that I could never have children. The thought of not having children was devastating. I had experienced the joy of intimacy with the man, and then I'd feel punished with a life-threatening emergency. <laughs> my fears were quelled when my doctor showed up and corrected the nurse's comment, but now I'm faced with a major incision in my pelvis that burned like fire every time I moved a little. The thought of still being able to have children sort of cooled down the fire a bit. Eleven days. Eleven days in that hospital felt like an eternity. I had needles in both of my arms and I hated that. When Dr. Kemp came to visit me, I asked him when the nurses could take them out. And he told me, I'll instruct them to do it as soon as you're strong enough. By about the fifth day, I just couldn't stand being hooked up to those needles anymore, and so Dr. Kemp said that they could be taken out if I promised to drink enough water. I just drank and drank. I was still losing a lot of weight, watching my legs get bonier and bonier, and I gained enough strength to be released from the hospital. My parents were there, waiting to take me home. So was my boyfriend. I chose Mr. Wright. During my recuperation, I had no money. My boyfriend's job was terminated, so he decided to sell a drum set that he played occasionally. We'd scrimp by on chicken pot pies for a quarter and Delaware punch. He proposed to me, and I accepted. Joy, joy, you got a love. And now, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to introduce this time a very... Right in the show, in the middle of the phone? <laughs> what, what is it, a phone call? Telephone for you, Mr. Burrow. Thank you, but you shouldn't be on camera. Why not? You're getting away with it. I was... <laughs> Brilliant. You will see him next week. Hello. <laughs> Who is this? O'Donnell Lauren. The beautiful young singing star with all the hit records. <laughs> Honey, it's a good thing you called, because you're on. Only three weeks after my trauma, I was to report to the Milton Berle show. Bobby Rydell and I were cast as regulars for the new Uncle Milty show on ABC TV. We would film live at the Hollywood Palace, a gorgeous art deco theater with an enormous stage. The fiasco of leaving home was peppered with ongoing trips for Dr. Pepper, accompanied by Maury still sharing a hotel room wherever I went. Travel with my dad and the Milton Berle show went on with true to form, Maury being pragmatic about the situation. As long as I was working, he was content not to badger me about my living situation. I would return to my studio apartment and find Mr. Wright grooming himself. His vanity went so far as to clean his nose with Q-tips. Any drawer I opened would have a note from him saying, I missed you. The kitchen cupboards were the same way. At first I thought, how romantic. But soon I realized it was excessive to the point of nausea. This regal veneer I once admired now only appeared to me as a wanting, needy person that was unemployed. 
After two months of this insanity, I acquiesced and gave him his ring back. He literally punched a wall until his knuckles bled. I walked away. Actually, I got into my little red Corvette and drove away. My destination was back to Grandview Boulevard, but it was as though the hands on my steering wheel wouldn't go directly to Mar Vista. <laughs> I took the sharp right turn to the hills of Sherman Oaks, where my friend Paul Peterson lived. After a brief time being married to Brenda Bonet, things unraveled very quickly between them. So we had something in common. What we really had in common was, and is, a mutual respect for one another. Amazing that he really never trespassed beyond a brother-sister relationship with me. He certainly was a stud. For kicks, he put me on the back of his motorcycle and drove me up the nearly vacant 405 freeway to Sunset Boulevard. It was around three o'clock in the afternoon, a time now when you couldn't approach the freeway without it being bumper to bumper. Back then, though, commuters hadn't made a habit of using it as readily as they do now. This explains why I would be willing to get on a motorcycle with him and go on the freeway. Wrapping my arms around the waist of my good friend Paul was a comforting feeling. Feeling the wind in my hair sort of eased my mind to go back to my parents' house. I knew I had an ally in Paul, and therefore, going home wasn't me against the world. Moving back home was not so tragic. Of course, I had to endure an I told you so attitude from Ruth and Maury, but essentially it was back to business as usual. How weird it felt to have the previous several months of chaos be completely ignored. My parents had felt so threatened by me moving out, both of them acted as if they had erased it from their memories. When you meet a boy that you like a lot and you fall in love, but he loves you not, if a flame should start as you hold him near, better keep your heart out of danger, dear. For the way of is the way of war and the day may come when you'll see him go then what will you do when he sets you free just the way that you said goodbye to me There was definitely an agenda. Now that I was nearly 20 years old, lurking in the shadows was the idea of doing clubs. The thought of dealing with inebriated adults and the distraction of waiters in the background with sounds of plates clanking and glasses clinking terrified me. I have a very vivid memory of being at a party with Maury's animator friends when I was a little girl at the time when Superman was the biggest thing on TV. This one man who had been drinking came over to me, and I found the smell on him so repulsive. It was so bitter and icky. I can smell it right now. 
That memory combined with my awareness of not feeling prepared to deal with people in an altered state was very off-putting. However, shortly after I had moved back home, I was booked to perform at the Blue Room at the Shoreham Hotel in Washington, D.C. The Shoreham hosted inaugural balls for presidents from President Roosevelt through to Bill Clinton. When the Beatles checked in on the 10th of February, 1964, to avoid fans... They arranged for the entire seventh floor to be there exclusively with one little obstacle. A family that was staying there refused to move, so the hotel took action by cutting off their electricity. The victims of circumstance must not have any clout with the Fab Four. The Shoreham was a big deal, important enough for Norman Brokaw, who ran the William Morris Agency, to send me a congratulatory telegram. I was to open for Mark Russell, the famed political satirist known for taking popular songs and changing the words to fit the politics. He had been at the Shoreham for a few years and would be there for many more after. Being in Washington, D.C., the entertainers that were successful there made their theme politics. I recall being in the elevator with Rich Little, who impersonated Richard Nixon. While we were staying at the Shoreham, there was a group of about a hundred Catholic schoolgirls chaperoned by nuns also staying in the hotel. Lying awake in bed one night, I could hear a scuttling outside, which was followed by a very loud thud. Looking outside, my dad and I saw one of the girls lying on a mezzanine roof, several stories below. Apparently, the nuns supervising the trip had been doing their 10 o'clock bed check. One young girl was obviously not where she should have been, and in her attempt to climb the balcony back to her room, she fell. The roof had stopped her falling to the ground, but she had landed on her back and couldn't move. Maury and I watched silent at the window as help was summoned, and people climbed onto the roof. We could hear her moaning. I think that she was in a state of shock and had injured herself so badly that she probably didn't have the energy to make much noise. A spotlight came from a helicopter hovering above. The slow process of lowering down a stretcher and the procedure of moving her began. I was devastated and perplexed that Maury's curiosity got the best of him and he didn't consider what just happened to a young woman close to my age. Looking back now, I'm surprised that my dad didn't put his arm around me and lead me away from the window. Instead, he just stood there staring. I felt in that moment that I was more his parent when I asked him if he thought that she would be paraplegic. I was worried that she had broken her spine. Again, my dad, a man of few words, remained silent as he watched the spectacle. And the helicopter took the girl away. I just kept my eyes on the whole situation. The thought going through my head was that it could have happened to anyone. She was trying to be a good girl and not get caught by the chaperoning nuns. I lay back in bed with the feeling that I had not wanted to do this event. It did not feel right for me. But as usual, I did not voice doubt about this career decision. This poor girl's fate proved to me that I could trust my intuition. My dad and I were in Washington for three days. The racial situation at the time was such that if a white person and a black person were walking on the sidewalk, the black person would step off the curb and into the street to let the white person pass. This was in a city where almost 70% of the population was black. The Shoreham itself was near a park. I had heard that there was a high crime rate in this area, and through the hotel window, I could hear it for myself. People getting accosted and literally mugged in the park. I heard women screaming. My dad and I didn't really talk about what we were both seeing on the street or hearing and seeing through the window of our shared room. There was always an extremely prevalent attitude for my parents to keep me focused on what I needed to do to work and get the job done, like a racehorse with blinders to keep me focused on the race. Maury was such a strange dichotomy of a young boy trapped in a man's body. 
I think spending four and a half years in an orphanage and eight years in the military caused him to repress a lot of emotion that he couldn't articulate. Alas, I have great empathy for him. He is another case of a lost childhood. I adopted his traits of survival, which made us both, in his words, a trooper. The underlying truth is that the quote-unquote lie my parents agreed to concerning my mother's illegitimate pregnancy and the biological father I was never to know about silenced Maury. Wow, that's such a story uh, regarding the Shoreham Hotel and that poor girl injuring herself so badly. And we will, I think, return to that. But I'm interested to begin in asking you, you know, what do you think drove you to move out relatively quickly with this new boyfriend? And I realise as I say that, that I've just made an inadvertent pun by saying what drove you out when it was obviously yeah. your new car drove you out. <laughs> yeah, well, yes, it was um, timing, I guess, you know, that suddenly I had the ability, you know, to seek some freedom and um and and I I just took the opportunity never knowing what the consequences would be of course mm. I mean at 19 years of age Adam mm. uh, <laughs> you know I mean 19 actually I guess um is probably more of a proper age these days of moving out and you know experiencing life on on mm. your own mm. you know um but it's of course, I had to, I, I think, I think I had to experience what it would be like without functioning with my parents, my mm. parents telling me what to do all the time. And, and of course, you know, when you're, when you're conditioned, you know, and programmed in that way, you're going to, you're going to bump into a lot of walls, which I did. Mm. And that's interesting you say that because I know we, uh, or you called this this new person Mr. Right, and of course he ultimately did turn out not to be Mr. Right. But I do I do kind of wonder sometimes those decisions where you know you needed to make a change and you needed to make a break. Ultimately, he wasn't the way to go. But I can see, or I can I guess understand that sometimes that, for want of a better term, almost almost desperation in that decision to to break free and here was an opportunity to do so even if if it didn't end up as as well as you would have hoped yeah i i honestly i i didn't realize that there was desperation mm. but i'm sure you know observing you know the overall situation <laughs> that yes looking back um i was desperate for some breathing room literally mm. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, you never know who affords you that opportunity, you know, <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> it could, it could be the right one. It could not, you know, I mean, of course, I think it all goes back to the lack of d discerning that, you know, I just, um, you know, you were going to, uh, discuss decisions and that's such a big subject for me, mm. you know, when, um, when a person grows up you know, having decisions made for them in probably every, every case you can imagine, you know, from someone in poverty, someone in royalty and the full gamut, as long as you're not given the um, empowerment to make decisions sequentially all along the way, you know, when you're born and, and throughout your life. Uh, so that you can fall down and pick yourself up and learn from those mistakes Mm. Um, you know, that to me, I mean, it's taken me all the, all this time to learn, um, dis what discernment is. I, I wouldn't even have been able to give you that definition. You know? <laughs> and that's so interesting, I think, because in many ways you were, you were a very responsible person for the age you were, but you weren't, as you said, allowed to make many or any decisions in your life, perhaps beyond a choice of costume or hair but even then that could be restricted by Maury I know we tell a story several episodes back where because you cut your hair short 
um, Maurice said, well, you can't sing like that. Um, so even even those things were, were controlled. And um, you did have some moments of being able to make your own decisions, such as being on the set of Shindig, where Jack Good would allow you to collaborate in terms of choosing songs and ideas and, and, and costuming and scenes and so on. But but I, I do kind of think it's this important point that I know we've spoken about before, that when parents are either too authoritarian, where it's they tell the child, this is the way it is, or perhaps even the opposite end of the spectrum where there isn't that guidance um, to make decisions where they're quite permissive parents, what can almost happen? It almost sounds like you had a bit of a combination of the two, that in some, some places they were, they were very stuck on what, what you had to do and this was the way it was going to be. And in other ways, they just kind of allowed, not, not allowed you to do whatever you wanted, but were certainly very inconsistent in, in their kind of guidance. And I think... Whereas with an authoritative approach, which is that kind of more gold standard of a parenting approach where parents do set down rules and expectations, but they also allow the child to develop that autonomy. And in developing that autonomy and, and being able to develop, I guess, self-efficacy to, to feel that you can make decisions that are good for you and right for you while you're supported by your parents, I think it can make it quite difficult at times to, when you haven't had that experience to not only be able to make decisions but also to trust yourself in the kinds of decisions that you do make subsequently yeah. mm. I, you're you're just calling it out as codependency you know <laughs> rather than interdependency and mm. i just have to be you know really honest with our listeners that only recently in the last few years since i reached a certain age did mm. i find out that there was even a darker agenda on my parents' um, uh, whatever, you know, checklist. Um, and that is that they um, made arrangements to have whatever income that I created mm. um, in their name. Right. Yeah. And, um, and so, you know, at least in this country with... Um, whatever benefits of pension and social security mm -hmm. and things like that, there's no evidence of my financial uh, rewards in my career. And that must be incredibly difficult because given how hard you worked and, and how much you did achieve to then see that and, and the idea that, that there, it wasn't taken care of in a way that could provide for your hard work. You know, I think it's interesting that even back then when you were speaking about buying the car, that it seemed to be that you, you, you kind of had some understanding, albeit it was probably foggy or cloudy at that point, about wanting to have something tangible, in this case a car, I guess, to make your contribution or your hard work more real or tangible rather than being something where you performed, you, 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 you approached your career with a very serious attitude, but you didn't necessarily see any reward from it where it was all put somewhere else that was going to, um, you know, I guess, look after the family, but also uh, a portion a part to your own future benefit but you mm -hmm. never saw any of that so I, yeah. I kind of yeah I wonder if the car was besides freedom of course and of course that's what you know those cars were such a representation of that back then and and probably even now for young kids but um to be able to have something to say you know what I'm I'm doing something here yes um I would say that maybe deep down in my um heart of hearts that I wanted to show myself some value Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> I mean, because because it was um, you helped me out with this terminology. Mm. You know, there was so much contradiction. Yeah. You know? Yeah. You're valuable, you know, then but you're but you have no value. You know? I mean, it was the messages were so inconsistent and so confusing. Mm. Um, you know, I mean, it was just a, looking back, it was just a huge control mechanism. And um, ultimately, it wasn't for my benefit. It was for their benefit. And, um, you know, now that we've lived through uh, an episode and we, maybe we're still living through it, heaven forbid, of, um, you know, narcissism mm -hmm. reigning supreme and um, any kind of, you know, dominance, uh, racial dominance, um, all of this inequality that that our planet has been struggling with forever 
um, you know, again, I, I'm just praying that Corona comes along and um, acts as a, a unifier in some way, ultimately, because she's not going away. Yeah, yeah, she is definitely not going away. And I think it's interesting you speak about that idea of narcissism because, you know, as as we know, as we've spoken about either on, on this podcast or, or, you know, privately, this idea of narcissism often coming from, I guess, a... A, a feeling of lack and it seemed that I guess so many decisions um, in your family life were almost driven by that sense of lack and that that wanting to I, I don't want to say wanting to feel better but kind of like that almost like there needed to be these things to to make the people within the family feel better or or feel less um, that sense of lack but ultimately I think that wasn't able to happen because there was never going to be enough for that. So I almost wonder, you know, when you talk about this idea of control, you know, I think there were some very powerful forces at play wanting to control you during that time so that you would do what you needed to do. But I also wonder if there was so much chaos in in your parents' own thinking that um, that kind of also had the effect of the control where that was probably more of an unconscious process from them where they, they were in so much, I guess, chaos themselves that that's when parents are unable to provide that structure and that guidance that allows you to feel, um, I guess, that there is, um, you know, you have to feel safe, to feel secure, and I guess to develop those sorts of abilities such as decision-making or self-efficacy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that um, hmm. in analysing, <laughs> yeah, in analysing, you know, the... Um, time of let's just say before the first world war Mm. um while there was so much european immigration going on Mm. um and then continuing for half the century basically uh you know europe migrating to the united states and from other places around the world not knowing languages you know Mm. i mean um kind of trying to survive in their own culture and but then you know trying to be a a blending into Mm. the american way of of life um uh you know i I think all of that sense of instability Mm. um you know creates internal chaos Mm. and um you know I, i would say that not for everyone but for so many because for so many people, including myself, you know, uh, just this recent move, when things are unfamiliar, when, th- when you literally experience the unknown, mm. what else can you do? At least this is what I'm learning in my life. What else can you do but trust that your guides show you the way and do it in the most loving way? Um, But let's go back, you know, to times when there's famine, when there's war, when there's poverty, when there's so much clash of cultures. Mm. And um, and there's, again, I mean, a lot of division initially, at least. And um, and all of that internal struggle, you know, just doesn't disappear. No, Um, no. So um, and the sense of empowerment was I mean, the American dream was alive and well when I was a child. Things the uh, environment was conducive to someone starting from nothing and becoming something. Mm, mm. Um, And, you know, that's in this country all over the world you know that still exists if you know one can be clear and see their path in life possibly with good guidance uh, from their family possibly with good guidance elsewhere um you know like oprah winfrey talks about maya angelo because Mm. her own private life you know her own childhood was was hideous absolutely yeah and but yet she did have a mentor And, um, and she could, she could learn discernment and she could, you know, with the, with how she came in and, and, you know, not to compare myself, but how I came (laughs) in, you know, internally, I I think, you know, when you have a connection to, I I always go back to this, when you have a connection with spirit, Mm. um, 
it, it, that to me is an infinite power. And I believe that, you know, Oprah Winfrey and so many others do have that. Maybe they don't call it the same thing, but they, they do kind of surrender to a higher force and a higher power. And that's just something I've done my whole life. But, you know, then you have all these layers of reality to get through. And, um, and then I must say that no matter what, um, I'm having an experience now that is so um, exhilarating and um, life fulfilling to to actually experience more of the unknown in this COVID time and and allow who I really am to emerge. And that's I, I think so many people perhaps are experiencing that right now, and it's it I guess becoming heightened from what occurred, um, you know, all throughout the world. But I think you really are talking about this idea of of that ability to tolerate I guess ambiguity and to be in in that unknown that idea that when we are searching for uh and I'm reminded of this just because I was only speaking about it the other day for one of the classes I teach and there was a a psychologist Victor Frankel who uh developed a a therapy which he called logotherapy which is really about this idea of helping people become more in touch with their meaning in life and, and their ability to search for what that meaning is for them and, um, you know, his experiences were actually born out of, of, amongst other things, being in concentration camps during World War II. And he spoke about this idea of, um, you know, when we're searching for our meaning or when we're looking for what the meaning in it is in our life, it can actually be uh, during times of adversity. That's, that's when we can often experience that, that when we're in that homeostasis where everything's kind of you know, just ticking along, that's not always where you, you're going to have the most growth and, and the most um, change. It's really about those times of upheaval, as painful as they are, when you can when you can have that growth and change and this idea that in any circumstance we're in, and I mean, his was an extreme circumstance, but any circumstance he talks about, this idea between the stimulus, what happens to us and the response is a space and that space is the attitude that we take towards those experiences. Mm, wow. Yeah, that is super extreme. Mm. And I think that's the thing that so much of his was driven by that, but it was also driven by, I guess, working with everyday patients and seeing the different adversities that people had, that it, it doesn't always have to be something at that level of extremity um, to allow us to grow and to allow us to, to change and to look for whatever that meaning is and, and, um, you know, meaning for him was this idea of not only achieving, which is important, but also this idea of living life, I guess, in, in line with values. And it kind of takes me back, I guess, to what you're talking about with this decision making. I think you, you're almost honing in, whether you call it spirit, whether you call it intuition, whatever you call it, is that even though perhaps when you're not allowed to make decisions or you haven't been raised to be able to trust your intuition to make good decisions is sometimes I think you can make decisions that that seem on the surface to be a bit more chaotic and it's almost that you know I told you so you know you your parents tell you you don't know how you how to make decisions you can't be without us and then you go and do something that looks a bit extreme and they're like see I told you that wasn't going to work out when you had to move home but even if the actual decision itself perhaps seems like it ultimately didn't work out I still think you, you, you're really honing in this idea that we need to trust our intuition of what we need at that time even if we are constricted in our ability to to um, uh, enact it I guess yeah and the timing is everything you know, mm. when I was 19, uh, it worked for two months, but actually not really because <laughs> I, mm. you know, mm. had to spend three weeks of those months in, yeah. in, in a yeah. hospital. Yeah. Um, but timing is everything. Only two years later, you know, timing was very, very different. So mm. hopefully some of our readers, maybe all of our readers um, have a, a, a take on, on karma or destiny, you know, or fate. Um, you know, like when we come in, I, how how is our calendar, you know, of events going to take place? And mm. um, you know, you might you might take two steps forward at one point in the direction that you ultimately, you know, go mm. in. Mm. Um, and still, that may not be. You might fall flat on your face when you finally do take the big step, 
but <laughs> but <laughs> I guess it's for me anyway personally it's it's um it's all been steps of progression and uh huge lessons that I've learned yeah absolutely and I think you know when even when you talk about this idea of of um, towards the end of the reading today that there wasn't always a way to discuss some of these these things that had occurred and often these quite traumatic things that I'm you know particularly ac- acutely aware at the moment of, of the need to process things that you're going through perhaps rather than the repression or the moving on without any processing and of course processing takes time but you know even talking about that idea of the poor girl falling out the window um, at that hotel you know at the time like you said there wasn't really a way to discuss these things or to process them I I guess because Maury and and what was he had difficulty with emotions as well I guess because of the product of of the way that he had been raised and the experiences that he had. But, you know, this idea that it's never too late to to begin to unpack some of these experiences in order to develop that understanding or that insight or that, that keen emotional awareness for, for what you have experienced. Yeah, uh, I'm sure that, you know, his, his childhood was traumatizing to a point. Mm. But, um, but truly, I think that our communication was was paralyzed because of the lie that that uh, my parents agreed to you know mm. based on not me wanting me to know who my biological father was yeah and um you know based on that how could how could they talk about anything how mm. could you know we could never have a conversation they could only be in control they could only be in command and i could you know if i <laughs> as long as i wanted to be in their safekeeping, uh, so to speak, um, you know, I I had to comply. I mean, there was mm. no other no other choice. I was just waiting for one of those those Oliver moments, you know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, wait, waiting for uh, waiting for my hero or waiting for that door to open. And mm. um, you know, and yes, Mister Wright seemed to be a door. Um, and, and my little red Corvette was certainly, mm. you know, my wheels and, um, I loved, I love that car, but, you know, amazingly as much as Maury photographed me for mm. my career, mm. he never once took a picture of my Corvette. What a shame, because I, I was just thinking when you talk about that, that dealership and just, that's kind of that real sort of iconic, um, you know, I, I I was just driving the other day because I know we were preparing to talk about this. And I was just looking around and thinking, we don't have, and I know Alison Martino spoke about this when, when you interviewed her a few episodes ago, but <laughs> yeah. we, we just don't have interesting, from my perspective, maybe I'm wrong and, and the listeners can tell me, but I just don't think we have interesting cars anymore compared to what Well, was. we have... We have interest in Teslas. We have interest. Mm. And, of course, mid-century people love their vintage cars. Absolutely, um, yeah. But between probably 1970 and, well, uh, maybe 72, mm. um, and um, until the Tesla, yeah, it was pretty generic. Yeah, it just feels like an – and I know I I, um, I I looked up that dealership a little bit and I – I think you're probably aware of this, but I think the, the the building of the dealership is still there. On I think it's really it's, oh yeah, I think it's an it's been an auction house for the past I don't know how many <laughs> oh years, gosh. but at least the building there. I think it's on the corner of um, Kirsten Avenue and was it would have been Sunset Boulevard or my oh, imagining that okay. maybe I'm maybe I'm not. Um, I hope I've got that right, but if I haven't, I'd be very interested. I, I think it would actually be really cool if some of our listeners did. Um, you know, write to us or email us at podcast at donnalauren.net to tell us about their first cars and, and you know, the, the dealerships that they, they got their first cars from because um, there's not a lot of information out there. So it is a shame that we don't have a picture of that car, but who knows, maybe, maybe someone has the same model and will send something in. You never know. Oh, my gosh. Well, living in Palm Springs for those years that mm. I did, um, I <laughs> I was given the great pleasure of seeing some beautiful, beautiful vintage cars, one of which resembled my first little car. Mm. And, um, you know, I <laughs> I just recall driving to Palm Springs in the 60s when, when I was all alone, you know. I mean, I would ha- take a day if I had uh, a day off and just put the top down, put the windows up, the heater on, and take off and 
and drive to Palm Springs for the day and drive home. So, you know, it, 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 um, it, it's just, um, yeah, very, uh, very interesting that Maury probably felt that that car represented too much freedom for me. Mm. Mm. And, um, and, and maybe there was even some jealousy that I just, you know, took a little uh, bit of charge, you know, that I demanded that. And, um, and I guess they felt all the money that was being made, you know, needed to be kept in their pockets. But, you know, I never knew that ultimately they were keeping it all. Yeah. And so I'm, in retrospect, I am quite happy that I took <laughs> took the lead <laughs> and and asked for that you know i mean yeah that i had some sense of value you know to to make that demand yeah i i i'd never con- I thought about that but it kind of makes good sense this idea that the car was almost a, a symbol or a trophy of of that freedom and, and perhaps not something that they necessarily wanted to therefore um you know celebrate And just following up, I guess, on the Shoreham Hotel, because that's quite a bit of a change from, I guess, the kinds of places you would have been used to performing, um, you know, and particularly in the area of Washington where everything, as you allude to, um, with the types of entertainment there was was so political. Do you have any sorts of, I guess, uh, either memories of of what you sang and what was kind of the underlying thinking or the approach that you took given, um, you know, you're you're performing, as you said, in, I guess, what would be called the adult rooms, um, you know, in, in, in the showroom. Yeah, I was booked at 19 and that goes against my, you know, my ethics of a minor performing in, in a room where people are drinking alcohol. Mm. And um, it, it actually was the one and only occasion that I remember mm. uh, having, having to do. And it seemed to be so important that it was just glossed over. And, um, and so, yes, when I, when I knew that that, that was going to be a, a special occasion, I insisted that I have charts written for certain songs right. that would be yeah. appropriate. Mm. And um, and my parents, I'm telling you, it was like, you know, squeezing blood out of a turnip. Mm. They had to pay for a, for, for a, a, an arranger, you know, to write charts so that I could show up and be prepared without a musical director. Yeah. You know, yeah. I mean, still. But I chose songs like he's got the whole world in his hands mm, mm. But, you know when i spoke to darlene you know i chose that as a song i don't know it was a it was a song that came from a gospel era and i just loved mahalia jackson and so mm. that and i sang that when the saints go marching in and um and then i i kind of turned on to uh bert backrack and i mm. recall doing a house is not a home i mean i was actually digging deep and choosing mm. material that was reflecting what was going on inside me and um and i've forgotten exactly how many musicians that it was written for but it was it was a, a band you know it was uh, a horn section and rhythm section mm. um, that accompanied me, and I still have the charts, by the way. Isn't that fantastic? And did you did you work with the um, the arranger to come I up did. with some of those songs? Yeah, yeah, I so. did. His name was Dick Grove, mm-hmm. and he was he had a very very sterling reputation um, at the time, and you know I was really really. Uh, I guess feeling more professional and secure now because in just thinking about, you know, a young person going into an adult situation, (laughs) that was my one ticket to feeling equal to the Mm. adults Mm. is being as prepared as I possibly could. Yeah, because I know that was often quite a a sticking point or, 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 or a reality for you was that you often felt that you had to go into these places do the best you you can often well without without charts without specially um formulated material and just be able to be a trooper i guess as, as maury put it but to to have the charts to have the preparation to have some involvement in in what was being chosen and and to quite represent just from those songs that you mentioned quite a departure 
I, I guess I, I can see the, the gravity or the importance of that particular performance at that hotel. Yeah, it was quite an experience. <laughs> you know, just being in Washington, D.C., being, um, you know, with these veteran performers um, and and then having the experience with someone my age, you know, having a tragedy occur. Mm-hmm. So, um, but I have to say that in my memory, the, the performance um, and the connection that I had with the audience um, was very respectful. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I think, as I recall, that there was a, a was a, a a time out for for dining you mm, know mm. so that so that there was no interference with what my performance was about <laughs> yeah the fact that it was it was it was done that way i think uh, sounds great yeah, yeah yeah but yeah choosing songs like you know w- what i had to do for dr pepper in dallas the day that um our president was assassinated Mm. And and on an occasion like this, where my awareness was of the segregation issues that was happening in D.C. Um, and just, you know, being a young woman and having, you know, no one as peers until I had that experience with that young woman, young girl, mm. Mm. Um, you know, um, was it was something that I did not want to repeat. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested. I guess because this wasn't a Dr. Pepper event. Did Dr. Pepper tend to have any sort of say over when they weren't Dr. Pepper events, what you could and couldn't do? I mean, I know obviously there were certain things that you couldn't do in the beach party films and so on, but in say in terms of material or other performances, was was that left up to, I guess, you and Maury to do that or was there still some stipulation there? You know, I, and as I recall, I was always selecting the songs that I was going to perform Mm. at every bottling plant occasion and every live performance that they would have me do. But they, you know, they were my selections um, pretty much all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And did they have to sign off on that or was it just, this is what, what you did and you were able to do that? Uh, They did not interfere with the Shoreham. They did when I did the simplicity pattern commercial, they had to give permission for me to do that. That was the only commercial that I could do. Yeah. Which I guess makes sense because that's kind of directly into the, the living rooms in the same way that the Dr. Pepper commercials and the Dr. Pepper <laughs> radio commercials would have, would have been. Yeah. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, there were times like with Shindig, there was never any, well, there was a Dr. Pepper representative. And I guess if I had done something inappropriate, you know, right. they would have spoken up, but mm. I never did. So yeah, that's that's actually really, really interesting to see that although this experience wasn't one that you'd want to repeat, um, you know, given what occurred, what it did allow you to do and to to have some of that say and to be able to get someone to to work with and collaborate with on those charts. Yes, well, for me, uh, <laughs> I guess I was feeling that um, clubs in general, that mm. environment just did not suit me. Mm. And, you know, it was stages, audiences seated, and, you know, that kind of concert environment. That's what I, I preferred. And, um, yeah, so sure, I had a taste. I had one taste of that. And apparently it was um, it was uh, something that the likes of Norman Brokaw thought, you know, was was maybe the next step would have been, you know, more more of that kind of involvement all over the world or in mm-hmm. this country, mm-hmm. um, because that would have been the future. We alluded to in the episode, or you alluded to in the reading, of working on the Milton Bell show. And we do have something special for the listeners coming up. Do you want to tell them a little bit about that? Yes. Well, I had the pleasure of reuniting with Bobby Rydell, my singing partner and Milton Burl. And mm-hmm. we had a lovely conversation during the uh, 
you know, the isolation uh, where he's living in Pennsylvania and, and I'm living, I was living back in Palm Springs area. Mm -hmm. So um, we had a, we had a lovely conversation and, and shared good memories. And, um, and it was, it was actually quite enchanting to speak with him. Mm, after, I guess, so many years as well. I, I don't know when the last time is that you would have spoken to him, but, um, you know, how, how cool to relive, I guess, some of those memories, particularly in that beautiful building that you filmed in for the Mildon Bell show. Oh, yes. Well, <laughs> that was actually across the street, directly across the street from the Capitol building. Mm, mm, I and, remember, yeah. yeah, I remember walking past it one night when I was in Los Angeles many years ago, and it's, it's, still, it's still there. I don't know what it's used for anymore, but that, that beautiful facade of that building is still there. Yeah, I, I think it turned into, I think, a p- punk rock club or something like that okay. at one Point, but I don't know what it is now. Well, you know, that's the importance of <laughs> the importance of place. And I think that kind of leads quite well into what's been happening recently. This in for you in particular, this importance of place and and finding a place to to settle into and to be creative in. And so I'm so glad that we have reconvened. Um, it has been too long, but it's so good to get back into uh, speaking about all sorts of things as we always do. So thank you for that, Donna. Oh, it's such a great pleasure to reunite with you, Adam, always. Fantastic. And until next time, everyone, thanks for tuning in. And as we always say, love's a secret weapon. Yes, yeah.